Hi everybody, I'm Carl Galloway with the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. I'm here with Ryan Buffet of Oysters Carolina and we are celebrating day two of Oyster Week in partnership with the NC Oyster Trail, the NC Sea Grant, and the NC Coastal Federation. Ryan, welcome. Thank you guys so much for having me. Is there anything you'd like to start off with? I, there is. Uh, I'm Ryan Bethay from Oysters Carolina. I want to quickly uh, do a land acknowledgement. I want to recognize that we are on stolen uh, land right now. We have about an acre of waterfront property at Harker's Island, which was some of the earliest land that was stolen. And uh, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that. Thank you. As I mentioned, Ryan is with Oysters Carolina, an educational and uh, operational oyster farm on Harker's Island on the coast of our state. Ryan, um, talk about the first time that you ate an oyster. First time I ate an oyster. So I was down in Destin, Florida. If anybody knows where that is, it's on the panhandle. So Florida, you know, is kind of like this. Up here in the panhandle, real south, uh, right south of Alabama. I was at a place called Steamboat. And uh, we used to go there after work and do, uh, you know, drink some adult beverages. And a bunch of friends were really into oysters, and they got a dozen raw oysters from Apalachicola, a historic uh, oyster place, right? They got great oysters down sure. there. And uh, that was my first oyster. So it was on a cracker with some cocktail sauce, some hot sauce, and man, I was hooked ever since. It was great. <laughs> and is that how you like oysters on a cracker? I would say for raw oysters, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I really, I tell people all the time, you know, if you put a raw oyster on a cracker, you're kind of forced to chew it. Yeah. A lot of folks want to just slurp it down. Chew that thing up. You know, put it on a cracker, add some lemon or any kind of citrus, right? Citrus and, and seafood go hand in hand. Sure. Uh, some cocktail sauce, hot sauce, chew that thing up. It's going to be delicious. Awesome. <laughs> and um, from that first oyster, I know it was a little bit of a winding path to Harker's Island mm -hmm. and to where you are right now. What mm -hmm. was it that um, kind of sold you on oysters? Uh, as a well, position or, or an inspiration? Well, you know, first of all, they're delicious, right? Um, they're, 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 I mean, we're, we're growing food here and it, it's wonderful. It's a healthy food, a uh, lot of protein, a lot of zinc, a lot of, a, you know, immune, immunity booster type stuff. Um, and then also, you know, we don't grow them in a building or, you know, in downtown Raleigh. We, gr we get to like work in the water. We get to, you know, half, you know, most of the time I'm out in the water, I'm, you know, waist deep in a North Carolina sound. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's amazing. You know, uh, I get to do, it's a job I get to do, not a job I've got to do. And, uh, and so that was one of the things that really sold me. Yeah. So basically you wake up on Harker's Island and take us through a little bit of your day. So I live in New Bern, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and it takes me about 55 minutes. Uh, my day, you know, my day really varies. I'm kind of in this weird limbo between being a business owner and an oyster farmer. So I've got like tons of paperwork to do. You know, that's kind of the not as romantic part of my job. But um, on a great day, I'd say I wake up, I get to go to Harkers Island. Uh, I walk through the path of our, our beautiful property on the nor north side of the island, uh, hop on the boat. And then it's about a mile ride to the farm. We go out there. Uh, we're either going to be cleaning, right, or we're going to be sorting or counting oysters. Those are pretty much the three main things that we do. Um, and I'd say the majority of that is cleaning. So uh, I'm, I'm out there. We're grabbing bags out of the cages. We're taking them back. We're dumping the bags out onto the fishing platform of our boat. Um, while I'm doing that, someone's going to be power washing and cleaning those bags up. Uh, and we'll put the, the oysters back in those bags and take them back out and uh, give them, you know, a nice clean bag to grow in. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. Um, what are some of your uh, your favorite memories so far? Is it just sort of a daily uh, blessing to be out there, or, or are there some uh, challenges as well that you've faced? I mean, I'm sure that comes along with growing any business. Right. But um, huh. are there some days where you're like, oysters, why oysters? Do <laughs> right. <laughs> Those days normally come in January, February. <laughs> uh, you know, so we're, since we're on the north side of the island, we've got about two miles of fetch. So fetch is just unimpeded uh, space for wind to blow. And so the wind can really build. So um, in North America, in the winter time, we get cold air 
from Canada and the Arctic. So that's from the north. It comes down, and that's where we're exposed. So not only are we exposed by uh, high mile an hour winds, but the wind is actually cold itself. So uh, you're battling the wind, and it's also a colder uh, time of the year. And not only that, that wind is going to bring big swells. So you're getting wetter than normal. It's deeper than normal. Um, those aren't those aren't my favorite days. Uh, you know, when it's a spring day, the water's nice and clear, you know, 75 degrees, a little breeze, no bugs, uh, you know, out there on the boat, you, you really can't beat it. Yeah. Um, one, I guess one memory that really, or one kind of type of memory that sticks out to me is um, I spend a lot of my work week driving. Um, so we deliver oysters anywhere in North Carolina for free. And, you know, when you deliver to either a low income area, high in income area, you deliver oysters to a North Carolina citizen um, that were fresh out of the water that day, people are very grateful. And so getting to meet other North Carolinians, um, getting, you know, it's, hum it's humble, humbling being, uh, being thanked by these yeah. folks. Um, so I'd say the, that memory really kind of sticks out to me. I really enjoy that part of this job. Absolutely. Um, that sounds really special, and I'm sure you made a lot of friendships. Oh, it's great. Along the way. I, mean, uh, I get to meet folks. so many people. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. You mentioned a little bit about the weather and fetch, uh, which is a new word for me. Um, and I'm wondering what it is that makes North Carolina so good for oysters. What makes it, is, is it different from Virginia, from Alabama, and, yep. and if so, what what uh, makes the difference there? That's a great question, and a lot of people that are listening, if you're from North Carolina, uh, I think you'll be excited to know this. Um, so, first of all, there's great oysters in Virginia. The Chesapeake Bay has got great oysters. I was fortunate enough to do my schooling up there. The Gulf, you know, we just talked about Apalachicola, historic, mm. uh, you know, great oysters come out of there. So there's great oysters everywhere. Um, what makes oysters in North Carolina unique is that our water is really, really pristine. So here's kind of the reason behind that. Um, if anybody's been to our coast, you know that uh, there's shoals and sandbars and inlets are constantly changing. They're opening, they're closing, all this different stuff. This has been the case, you know, since, you know, since colonization. So um, imagine folks trying to navigate that water and those waterways with big sailing ships. It's, you know, it's just not, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. So people just kind of skipped North Carolina and went up north to Virginia or went south to Charleston. And so we don't have a ton of development on our coast. So we don't have, you know, huge refineries. We don't have, um, you know, lo really large ports. So what that's done is that's kept our water really pristine. Um, and that's what makes great oyster water. Yeah. You know, you've got to have food um, for the oysters to eat. But the main thing is you've got to have, uh, you know, pristine water. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, that's what really makes North Carolina oysters uh, kind of a step above. Yeah, that is so interesting um, that it's purely logistics or... Um, Exactly. Yeah. An inability or an, in an inaccessible space that's given us uh, some of the oysters that you grow today. And there's one that turns green with yeah. algae. Mm -hmm. Talk about some of these some of these varieties and like what kind of uh, different tastes we can get or notes we can get out of these mm. different oysters. Yep. Um, geek out a little bit if you want. Oh, let's geek. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, all, all the oysters that we grow in North Carolina and up and down the Atlantic coast. So we're talking Canada, even Gulf and Mexico. That's called Crastrostrea virginicus, so the eastern oyster. So you might go to Apalachicola, and that oyster tastes different than mm -hmm. an oyster from Stump Sound, than you know, Beausoleil's and uh, you know Prince Edward Island. Right. And but all those are the, actually the same species of oysters. Um, so what in, in the industry we call it site specific. So where you actually grow the oysters. So we grow them at Harker's Island. That oyster is one of the saltiest oysters in the country. Okay. Um, you can go two miles away up the North River and you've got a medium salinity oyster. It's still great. It just tastes, it tastes different. And the oysters kind of grow a little bit different. There's fouling, there's, you know, amounts of food, there's water flow. Um, so that kind of changes how an oyster is grown, how it tastes. We call it uh, miroir. 
in the industry. So, and with wine, it's terroir, uh -huh. right? You can plant a cab grape in North Carolina, and it's going to taste different than if you grow it in Napa, gotcha. uh, even though it's the same grape. So it's the same with oysters. In terms of the green gill oysters that you brought up, Carl, yeah. uh, we we can speculate. It's a we speculate here in North Carolina that we, there's a particular hasla that blooms in the winter months. So when the water gets cold, we actually see kind of a, a blooming of it. And what that does is as the oyster is filtering water, it's going to stain those oyster gills green. Right. And it really, it's really neat because uh, first of all, that hasla is supposed to have um, anti-inflammatory, antiviral properties, mm -hmm. which is so cool, right? It's nature. And then it's also going to give this kind of dark leafy vegetal type taste to the oyster. Uh, um, you know, just like if you were to take an oyster from our farm at Harker's Island and put it in the White Oak River, how it's going to taste, you know, it's going to, that's going to change the taste after a little bit. Right. It's the same, you know, with this hassle that blooms. Incredible. Once, you know, once it kind of gets going, then the oyster uh, turns this beautiful kind of jade color and uh, yeah, it tastes great. And then, like I said, there's there's some healthy properties to it. Wow, so just like anything else, it, um, it takes on what it's in exactly. and what's around it, and then that's what we're consuming. That's what we're consuming, yeah. Makes sense. Um, <laughs> beyond the great taste, oysters have uh, uh, a condition or um, are known as a keystone species, is that right? They're really necessary for a lot of uh, things around them. Can you talk a little bit about um, their importance for the environment and what they do on like day to day and what would happen if maybe they weren't there. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, that vocab word is is huge. I mean, it is. It's a keystone species. Yeah. So when you hear that word, you can kind of you know that that means that uh, oysters are kind of like the foundation for all different kinds of life. So there's really two main reasons that oysters are, are considered keystone species. One is something that a lot of people overlook. It's, it's structure, right? I mean, these are shells that are in the water. They're all different, you know, space, you know, they're angles and they look different. That's a great place for juvenile fish. Right. So in North Carolina, a lot of our sport fish species and a lot of our um, species that we consume, right? They start their lives or they live their entire lives in the estuaries. It's called an estuary, right? It means they, it holds babies. Right. So, um, huh. you know, We've got juvenile fin fish, juvenile crabs, all kinds of things, um, juvenile shrimp that live actually in the nooks and crannies of these oysters. And, um, you know, we, we shrimp taste delicious, right? North Carolina shrimp tastes delicious. We're not the only species that thinks that, right? You know, redfish, you know, black drum, everything like that loves juvenile shrimp, loves any kind of shrimp. So it gives them a place to hide as mm. they're developing and growing. And a lot of these species actually move out to open ocean after a certain amount of right. time. The second thing that oysters do uh, in terms of contributing to the environment is they're gonna filter that water, okay? We all, uh, most of here, most of us know that. Yeah. Okay, but what that does is that takes particles from the water column, and even if the oyster doesn't ingest it, it's going to get rid of it in, uh, the stuff's called pseudofeces. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not the right size for the oyster, maybe it's not something the oyster wants to eat, it's still going to collect that out of the water column and get rid of it, and it's going to sink. It's yeah. going to be heavier than what you know the particle was initially. Yeah. So it's going to take all that out of the water column, so that's going to clear the water up. And so I think we all kind of know that part, but so why is it important to have clear water instead of you know, turbid water? Mm -hmm. Well, when the water is clear like that, it allows sunlight to penetrate farther, which then the seagrass can grow. Um, seagrass is is another keystone species. It's really important because just like how we get our oxygen from trees and grass and things like that on land terrestrially, in the water, fish get their dissolved oxygen through seagrass and other macroalgae, things like that. So when you allow the sun to penetrate the bottom, right. you get these patches of seagrass, which is like essentially a pa you know a thing that is creating a lot of dissolved oxygen, right. which that's what fish need. Yeah. So those are the two things that are that oysters do um, that are really important for kind of the ecosystem and what make them a keystone species. Yeah, uh, that's incredible. It is. Before I get to the next question, I want to remind folks that um, please feel free to drop your questions 
uh, in the chat if you have any, and we will address them with the expert. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that, but I can't <laughs> wait to answer some questions. Well, you got me beat. Um, so your operation, you do delivery throughout the state, mm -hmm. and it seems uh, fairly grassroots. Um, not, not necessarily basic, but very pared down. Um, do you think that that's true of the North Carolina Sea, like in general, or of the North Carolina oyster scene in general? I mean, and um, what sort of advantages do you think that that provides? Like just having this connection with folks, this direct connection. Hmm. Or is that something that maybe you wouldn't categorize your your, your operation as? Um. Well, you know, uh, you know, just speaking on my operation, I think you know people have been really receptive to it, which has been great. Um, you know, folks are. They're getting oysters. What we do is we pull them out of the water that day. So people will order oysters all week, you know, and then, you know, they'll say, I want nine oysters. I want 200 oysters. So we're counting them all week. And then that morning that we deliver, we pull them out of the water. We take a picture and video with the timestamp. We text it to them and then we drive it anywhere in North Carolina free delivery. I think what that does is that gives people um, some trust, uh, you know, seafood, really food. Uh, in general, but definitely seafood has a transparency issue. Um, it doesn't take you know much Googling to, to see that there's a lot of mislabeling with seafood. Right. So we really wanted to kind of take that, that out of the equation. So I think people are really thankful for that and we get a lot of good feedback. Yeah. Um, in terms of the industry in North Carolina itself, it is, it's growing, uh, I mean, exponentially, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. So we've had tons of help from Roy Cooper. Um, we have, you know, this industry is a bipartisanly supported industry. Uh, all the state, almost all the state legislators have supported us, both sides, Democrats, Republicans. Um, there's not a lot of issues like that mm -hmm. in North Carolina politics. You know, we're, we've, we're a progressive Southern state, so there's a lot of things that come with that. But this, but growing the North Carolina oyster industry is good for rural North Carolinians. It's good for North Carolinians that live in big cities that eat seafood. It's good for the health of the people. And it's good, you know, for the folks that are actually taking this, this on. Right. Um, and I mean that by, you know, everything from St. Rock downtown, you know, they're selling a lot of North Carolina oysters all the way to, you know, gentlemen growing oysters in the Newport River. Yeah. So it's... It's a nice industry for North Carolina. We're getting tons of support, and uh, there's a lot of really good oyster farmers and commercial fishermen that do wild harvest uh, out there. Right. And um, man, it's a healthy industry, and it's it's really exciting to be a part of. Yeah, it's incredibly exciting, um, and I'm sure really good for the eastern part of the state too. Mm. Um, I wonder how you would encourage folks to uh, who might visit the North Carolina coast to engage with it. Uh, beyond uh, the, the the typical beaches and the um, the large houses, or right. just your week vacation that you usually have, what, what what advice would you give to someone who who goes out there every year with their family to engage more with this uh, uh, with this industry, but also with this sort of environment and the knowledge of what's living and growing out there? Yep. So uh, you know, Sea Grant and some other entities have kind of got together. NC State, Sea Mast have kind of gotten together to create the North Carolina Oyster Trail. And that's going to be a series of restaurants yeah. and you know distributors and oyster farmers um, that are kind of all together in this thing. What I would say is, if you're coming down to the coast, there's a lot of oyster farmers that are part of the North Carolina, you know, Oyster Trail, right. and some that aren't part of it that offer tours. So depending on the oyster farmer, depending on the area, you can go out see how a working farm is. Yeah. Um, it's going to be different than what you imagine. No matter how many videos you watch and stuff, people are always just amazed, you know, at what it is. Right. You're, you know, it's going to be a great experience because you're on the water. You know, you really can't beat that uh, on someone else's boat, which is much better than having your own boat. Yeah. You know, uh, and so you know, there's lots of farms that offer tours and yeah. things like that. Um, I think it's really important to know too that you can support this industry. You can be a part of this industry you know, in Raleigh, in Durham, in Charlotte. If you just, uh, if you look for North Carolina oysters, mm -hmm. um, they're everywhere. And uh, if you support that, if you eat that, you know, you're eating, if you eat one of our oysters, you're eating an oyster I've touched seven or eight times. 
You know, if you eat, you know, Crystal Coast oysters or, you know, Three Little Spats oysters or, or you know, um, Soundside Selects, yeah. you know, you're, you're helping a North Carolina family. You know, these aren't giant uh, seafood entities at the coast that's run by someone in California or in Canada or in Europe. These are, these are farms where the people that work them actually live, you know, in North Carolina. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't be able to get a lease without it. You have to be a North Carolina citizen. So um, I'd say that's, you know, that's something that the tours is something you can do down at the coast, but then you can eat North Carolina oysters anywhere. So that, that'd be my response. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, such a connection, an intimate connection with the food cycle. Um, right. We have one question. Oh, this is cool. We got questions. <laughs> Elena says, when did you know that you wanted to go into the oyster industry? BTW, love your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ms. Grace, how you doing? Um, thanks, I, I can kind of see your picture. I'm sh it looks like uh, I like your hair too. It looks uh, very nice. <laughs> um, uh, when did I want to know when I got in the oyster industry? So it's, it's really funny. I was, I'm fortunate enough to be able to say that when I read an article about North Carolina oyster farming, I could barely sleep that night. I mean, I pretty much was, in 2011, I was bartending, and then I was starting to steer my life towards oyster farming. I literally read one article and, uh, and kind of thought, hey, this is, this is it. Uh, and along the way, I got to do some, you know, privilege to do some really nice things like teach and things like that. But, um, you know, I'd say when, 2011, mm -hmm. why, I read an article in a, kind of a, a publication most people throw away. Yeah. And, uh, you know, here we are now. It's taken, you know, what, 10 years to get here. Um, but as soon as I read it, I knew that this is, uh, this is what I wanted to do. Yeah. So, yeah. 10 years is a long time, but not necessarily that long uh, for such a, such a project. I, right. correct me if right. I'm wrong, right. Right. but I think that your, your dad was a city admin Mm -hmm. in Durham yeah and your mom was a bring teacher. up the family yes. yeah yeah I well, got a great family <laughs> <laughs> I'm very lucky about that yeah and so he did a lot of public works and uh, your your mom was a teacher in in higher ed mm -hmm. and I mean surely among lots of other things yeah among many many other things yeah yep. and I'm sure that those models had a lot to do with um, how your business seems community-based but also is is gearing towards education so I mean talk you've talked a lot about the community-based aspect right. of What's important oysters and Oysters yeah. Carolina, just getting to know people and, and giving back to the land as well as to the communities. But what kind of education do you do on Harker's Island? What do you teach people? Oh. And what is Harker? What does your operation look like? It's based on, or it's backed by Marsh and backed by and fronted by Coast. Right. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So you know, the first thing, and I think that's something that some folks really know. Other folks have no idea. They think of a farm as kind of a roped off area. Maybe they think it's on land. Maybe they think it's in a building. This is right out in the middle of the sound. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're, we're, so if Harker's Island runs east to west, we're on the north side of it up here in a place called Westmouth Bay, mm -hmm. like by the Straits. Um, and it's, I mean, you're in the middle of the marsh. Yeah. Uh, and you're, I mean, you're not really protected at all. So um, that's kind of the first thing in terms of the geography. Um, of our farm, but you know, there's, you know, it's it's just really, I guess, important for all of us to kind of know how how all that works. Yeah. Yeah. To understand that and to yep. understand the, the the full ecosystem of it. Yeah, definitely, I definitely. See what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly uh, Burke has an interesting question. Oh. Uh, many impoverished families back in the woods where I live that may not have access financially for this type of surface, nor transportation. So the free aspect is wonderful. How does that work? Oh. Maybe she's talking about the delivery service, right. or maybe about how many folks, do you, do you um, reach folks who, are, who live way back in the woods, or who live in, in oh, underpopulated yeah. areas? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. if you're gonna deliver anything in North Carolina, you're gonna go back in the woods. Yeah. It sounds <laughs> like Ms. Burke lives out in the sticks. I like it, Ms. Burke. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that's a huge part of our, kind of, of what we wanna do, right? We want to, you know, we could say, okay, we'll deliver anywhere in North Carolina, but there's going to be a fee. Yeah. We could say we'll deliver for free in anywhere in North Carolina, but you need to order 50 oysters. Right. What we found is when we're talking about North Carolinians as a whole, we need to be conscious of elderly people right. that don't need to eat 50 oysters, right. right? 
We need to be conscious of folks. We talked a little bit before uh, the show today about uh, transportation, really right. limiting uh, people with low economic status. Right. Um, even people that aren't low economic status, transportation is limiting in the South. Sure. Um, so we want to do the free delivery for those folks that don't have transportation. We want to do no minimum for people that can't afford or don't want to get 50 oysters. Um, and so, yeah, we, you know, we get to go everywhere from Roanoke Rapids, uh, which is, you know, in the northern part of the state, right. all the way to, you know, Ballantyne, which is one of the, you know, wealthiest areas in the state right. and everything in between. So we might go down a dirt road for a mile and a half, or we might be entering in, you know, a keypad to get into a, a country club wow. all in the same day. Hmm. Um, and that's North Carolina. So uh, it, it's, it really is a privilege for us to get to do that. Absolutely, and oysters are, uh, are, are traveling all those roads. Let's see here. <laughs> all right, yeah, they really are. We got well-traveled oysters. Um, some folks are asking, uh, Taylor, are there any opportunities for people down east to be able to volunteer with oyster farming? Yeah, so Taylor, that's a tough one because every oyster, most oyster farmers are gonna get um, lots of emails and Facebook DMs and stuff like that saying, hey, all volunteer, right. you know, and you'd think, okay, if I'm just gonna offer myself for free, I should easily be able to get on. Um, it's not quite that simple, and that's because, you know, we don't really have a schedule. We're, our schedule is dependent on tides, uh, weather, wind. Um, a lot of my schedule is dictated by, you know, somebody texting me, hey, I need, you know, 200 oysters. Right. Or, you know, the one restaurant we work with is Heron's at the Umstead. If chef messages me, you know, my plan might be, okay, I'm gonna go get a work day in on Thursday, mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna power wash a bunch of bags, go through oysters. I might get a text Wednesday night saying, hey, we need oysters tomorrow. Right. So then that kind of changes my day. So um, I would say there are opportunities. Uh, be persistent. Um, I mean, you're, you're dealing with folks that have been on a boat all day. So I'd say be persistent and there should be plenty of opportunities. Yeah. We, we really appreciate, we all get the single DM keep you know keep reaching out keep reaching out and then do a bunch of things that uh might not have anything to do with oyster farming right you know and then and then slowly you'll you know that'll be seen and you'll kind of be able to work on a farm that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. um have you observed natalie asks any changes in the environment that have affected your operation um and are there any changes that you worry about huh um Let's see, I mean, there's, so ocean acidification is uh, something that is happening in other places in the Atlantic. It's a big problem in the Pacific. What that is, is um, I'll just kind of do a quick kind of rundown of it. Sure. So carbon dioxide and thing, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, all these things, look, they float up in the air, right? And then a lot of people think they go in the ozone and they create holes, which they do. Most of that, though, is actually heavier than the air, and so it sinks and it lands in our oceans. Mm -hmm. um, that changes the pH level of our oceans. Uh, when you're changing the pH level of an ocean system, you're going to mostly affect uh, things that use calcium carbonate, so things that make shells. Right. So whether it's bivalves, like oysters, mussels, clams, or crustaceans, right? right. Like blue crab, Calanectes mm -hmm. uh spider crabs, mud crabs, stone crabs. Um, it's going to affect their ability to, to essentially make their exoskeleton. Um, so that's something that I definitely worry about. In terms of what I've seen, um, we talked a little bit before we started uh, the show today. Right. We've, the weather patterns are, are different. They're not as consistent as summertime, wind comes from the south, wintertime, wind comes from the north. Uh, we're starting to see kind of some variations. And, uh, you know, part of that's just North Carolina weather. Yeah. You know, a lot of folks on here are, are probably thinking like, oh, that's just I like. I see that all the time. Oh, I mean, we've had 70 deg degree days during Christmas. Sure. You know, so um, I'd say the ocean acidification is something that I'm worried about. Yeah. Uh, but um, again, North Carolina is really lucky in we are not being as affected as other places uh, with climate change. I see. Let's see, uh, from Elena, giving a shout out to Miss Dumay in oceanography. So shout out Miss Dumay. 
Miss <laughs> Dumay. Down at the bottom there. <laughs> um, are there any difference between bagged and wild caught oysters? Yeah, so um, bagged, I'm assuming uh, Miss Van Noy is, is going to be like farmed versus wild. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question. So what we do is we get oysters that are from a hatchery. Yeah. So some hatcheries are like wooden troughs, you know, down east in North Carolina. Others are, you know, buildings with like cement and things like that in Virginia, like yeah. more like a lab. Um, but we get oyster seed from there. So what they do is they spawn oysters mm -hmm. and then they make oysters and they grow them up. They go through a whole bunch of different processes. They put them in upwellers, downwellers, things like that. And then we get oyster seed that is anywhere from a quarter inch to a half inch, sometimes yeah. larger, sometimes smaller, depending on the, you know, the farm. Yeah. And then we grow them out. Um, but those oysters are, are pretty much the same as wild oysters. So I'll tell a quick story that kind of um, will help talk about the sustainability of it and um, kind of melt the two differences together. Sure. So we had, we worked with some kids from NC State. They came out to our farm. Um, again, the farm is in the middle of the sound. So there's oysters growing, there's wild oysters growing all over our farmed oysters. Yeah. And they took 20 oysters off of the farm. They took them back to their hatchery. They strip spawn them, which is just with a scalpel. They take the gonad out. It's a whole thing. Um, we can get into it if somebody asks. <laughs> and then they return to our farm with 280,000 oysters. Right. So we took 20 wild oysters. We came back 280,000. Yeah. Those oysters were wild when they were 20. The 20 were wild. And then the 280,000 that are now in oyster bags are farmed. Mm. But it's the same oyster, the same genetics, the same lineage, and they came from the same place. Right. Um, so obviously there's differences, but they're pretty, they're pretty small. Yeah. Um, then also, another thing I want to say about that is with the oyster industry in North Carolina and the U.S. Yeah. increasing like this, um, oyster farmers aren't here to take oysters away or to sell, you know, oysters that someone else would buy normally wild caught and have them buy farmed. Mm. There's so much, we, we don't, we haven't met the demand yet. So the wild harvest guys, those guys sell all the oysters they can sell. The farmed guys sell all the oysters they can sell. Um, there's no competition at all. Right. Um, if anything, they're just, you know, each one is kind of leveling up the other one and increasing prices. Right. I mean, it's hard to find a bushel of oysters for $60 and under, you know? I got guys that tell me all the time, they're like, you know, I bought oysters, $5 a bushel. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so it's great because that money is going, you know, nobody should get paid $5 to harvest a bushel of oysters. Right. That's, it's so hard to do. Right. Uh, so, you know, fortunately those guys are getting, you know, the price of their oysters is increasing just like ours is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a great question, Miss Van Noy. Yep. Um, and following up on that, uh, you may or may not be familiar with this. If is the acidification just to sort of draw a line? Is that what's killing the coral reefs too? Yeah. Is that the same thing that you're worried yep. about? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Any kind of shelled thing, you know, calcium carbonate. So for someone who's interested in getting into this industry one way or another, talk a little bit about your background. Um, geography, I think, mm -hmm. um, and sort of what how, what you might recommend for someone, not necessarily volunteering, but who's maybe having that same moment right now where you said, "I got it. Oysters are important." Right. Oh man. So um, so I did my you know once I read the article, went back to school. Um, you know, I got to go through the geography program at Central. Okay. So you know, fly eagles, <laughs> and it was I mean it was great. So the geography program there, a lot of folks including myself, we're thinking it was going to be a lot of, to do with maps and yeah. things. It's pretty much just earth systems. So I use the information that I, that I gained at Central almost every day. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the direction of the waves with what's going on underneath the water with the sand, the turbidity, all these things, all these things like that I learned. So I had a technical background. Uh, after graduation, um, I was selected to be part of the Oyster Aquaculture Training Program up at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Mm. And that really gave me a strong technical background. So I kind of had the earth systems technical with geography and oceanography, and then was able to 
um, learn about oyster genetics right. and things like that that are, uh, I got to say, ultra boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're spending a lot of time looking at a microscope. Right. But, you know, again, you know, you gain, you gain knowledge all different types of ways. And uh, if you really just kind of dive in and read as much as you can, watch as many YouTube videos, you know, if there's somebody on here, you're watching this kind of stuff. Right. That's, you know, that's what you need. You just need the passion and, uh, you know, and the hunger for the information. And then I think you'll get it. And you get it. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Holt asks, how do you secure a farm in the open water? You said you have to be a North Carolina citizen mm -hmm. to get space down there. Yep. And um, maybe there are um, some other yeah. minutia that we don't understand. And right, and how right. How that works that might be different from buying a farm on land. Right. So North Carolina, every state is different with this. Um, North Carolina, another thing that shows just how great we are, right. is our waters are considered a public trust. So if you're right. a North Carolina citizen, you own our waters. And uh, so, th so that's pretty cool. Um, but with an oyster lease, you can buy, sell, and trade them. Mm -hmm. So what happens is um, if you don't buy an, existent le an existing lease, what yeah. you do is you go out, to the marsh, the river, the sound, wherever you feel would be a good place to grow oysters. Right. Okay. You stake it off and then you submit that to the state. What the state will do is the state will go out there, uh, well, the state will go on a, on a computer and use like GIS. Right. Okay. Geographic Information Systems, a mapping software. Mm -hmm. It's going to look, you know, at what has been there historically. Right. And the two things they don't want to see are submerged aquatic vegetation, so the acronym's SAV, so seagrass, other macroalgae, mm. because we just talked about the keystone species. Right. We don't want to disturb that. Oyster farms, we're finding, uh, we don't have any science to back it up, yeah. but we're finding that oyster farms actually bring more seagrass yeah. and more, um, you know, flora out there. Right. But, um, you know, they don't want you to grow oysters on something that's existing the seagrass existing. I see. Um, so that's one thing. Also, is it a place where they've had uh, lots of oysters already? Yeah. Because that that might be someone's livelihood. Someone yeah. that might be someone's spot to go out there and, and harvest oysters. Whether you know that's subsist subsistence farming, where they're doing it for themselves right. or to sell. Um, so those are the two main things they're going to look for. Yeah. Is hey, are is there SAV and are there oysters there? The next thing they're going to look at is this going to impede a waterway? Yeah. You know, is this you can't put this right in the middle of the ICW, right? We've got boats coming here, and you know, there's people well, what water is the ICW for people who might not know. The Inland Coastal Waterway. Um, no farms in the Inland Coastal Waterway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No farms, no farms, <laughs> that and that sense. you know that goes all the way up the east east coast and gotcha. down. Um, so uh, that's what they're going to look at. Mm -hmm. So once they look at that. And then, you know, they say, okay, you're good. You put your markers out there. They come out, they survey the property, that, or the water, mm -hmm. not the property. They survey the, the water, and then they take it, uh, they put it in a, an ad in the paper, so for public comment. Yeah. And then you kind of go through different checks. Are you a North Carolina citizen? Things like that. And then that's how people get a lease. I see. Yeah. A uh, couple other great questions. The second one is a really good way to talk um, broadly about what we're, uh, uh, what we're discussing here. Right. Um, Linda says, if we're on Harker's Island, how can we find you? Oh, just reach out, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so All we, right, Ryan. <laughs> uh, yeah, shoot me a text. Uh, so we have, you know, we have a website, oysterscarolina.com. Uh, but if you put an order in on there, someone's going to reach out to you, hopefully within 24 hours. Um, so I tell people all the time, the best way to contact me or to order oysters is just to call or text me. Mm -hmm. I mean, Carl, you know, we've brought you oysters and, you know, <laughs> we, you know, you and I get a text. So um, we tell folks all the time after that first time online, just call or text me. And uh, if you're at Harker's Island, maybe we can just meet you at the boat ramp. If you're in Charlotte, we'll just bring them to you. So but cool. yeah, just reach out. That's the best way. Even if you just have questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. J Jessalyn asks, uh, what do you think about the future? How do you want to see your work grow in the next few years? And what do you hope to see for North Carolina more broadly? I went, yeah, how do you, how do you see the aquaculture <laughs> scene growing? Well, do you want it to grow quickly? Do you want it to grow slowly, sustainably? I, do, I suppose these, you think about this a lot. Interesting. Yeah, what a, what a vague uh, question. Thanks, Jesslyn. <laughs> um, you know, the, the future um, of the North Carolina oyster industry, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is 
I guess I don't want to give it like any kind of caveat. North Carolina is poised to be the ideal oyster for all of North America. Um, we've heard of Apalachicola oysters, right? We talked about that. Um, we know of Napa Valley has wine, right? We know North Carolina has barbecue. We know St. Louis has ribs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the support that we have from kind of government administration, mm -hmm. with the people that we have growing oysters now in North Carolina, uh, with the water that we have and the room to grow, North Carolina is really in a position to be the number one oyster in either America or North America. Yeah. So um, I really don't think it's far-fetched to think that um, in the future, North Carolina will be known for beer, barbecue, and oysters, right? And we've got two of those things already. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, um, that's kind of where I see, where I see that. Growing and growing. Yeah, just continuing to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is something you talked a little bit about earlier uh, in, in terms of farm um, oysters and wild-caught oysters. Uh, Taylor says, in Tidewater, Virginia, we are seeing some tensions rising between boaters, waterfront owners, and oyster farmers. Mm -hmm. Are you experiencing any of that? It's probably some interesting um, historic communities, traditional communities, yep. and as things change, yep. conversations are happening. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, you're... you're you know, there's, you're putting an industry in place where there was no industry before. Right. Um, so Taylor, I, you know, up in Virginia, I saw this firsthand. So what they call, the acronym is NIMBY, right? Not mm -hmm. in my backyard. We see that in some places in North Carolina, but not many. Um, and I think the North Carolina farmers, the people that are in the middle of the conflict have done a really good job, you know, being sensible about mm -hmm. it. You know, none of us in the oyster industry, if you had a house there and you love looking out this beautiful view of the water, right? We know that's why you have a house there. We don't want to put an oyster farm there. Right. We really don't. Um, but, you know, there is, you know, there, there's, there's going to be some kind of back and forth. I mean, there's, there's some people that don't want it at all. They think that there's going to be trash left. Yeah. They think, you know, the structure is going to be bad. But I'd say more, most people in North Carolina are really supportive of the industry. Right. Um, it's going to clean the water. It's going to provide uh, better fishing. You know, I think there's a big dispute, you know, with, with recreational fishermen, commercial fishermen that's kind of quelling right. but, or being quelled. But, um, you know, oysters are helping all that stuff. And uh, I think homeowners have been great. I think oyster farmers have been great. Mm -hmm. And... Um, also, too, in Virginia, it's a dollar a year for rent. Right. So, so many people have oyster farms, and there's so many oyster farms in places that there shouldn't be. A dollar a year to rent an oyster farm? Yeah. To, so, we pay, we pay like a, a lease, like a, we pay a rent fee uh -huh. every year. Some states, it's astronomical. Other states, like Virginia, it's ultra cheap. Um, we also have production reports. So, we can't just, okay, I'm going to buy, I'm going to get this this area of water to grow oysters in, yeah. and I'm not gonna grow any oysters. Yeah. I'm just gonna keep it so nobody will grow oysters. So you have all those kinds of things in, um, in states that have industries that uh, grew in the 70s and 80s yeah. instead of now, um, where it kind of grew too fast to be legislated and regulated. Right. In North Carolina, we've got you know legislation kind of in place. We've got people that are willing to regulate, people that are willing to be regulated. Mm. Um, and so we don't have as many problems with uh, boaters yeah. getting upset and neighbors and things like that. I see. Yep. Great question, Taylor. Uh, Real Good Fishing asks about your current lease support, if there's room for future growth, and if you're looking to grow, I guess. Yeah. That's the question. Real Good Fish, and I hope you're doing some good fishing, bro. Real good. <laughs> Real good. <laughs> I love it. Thanks for asking the question. Um, yeah, so we only use, uh, man, an acre, an acre, probably acre and a half to mm -hmm. grow oysters. We've got five and a quarter acre, yeah, um, like near White Point, yeah. like I said, at Harker's Island. And we can grow, it, what we do is called, it's called intensive aquaculture. Yeah. Um, and intensive aquaculture, you can grow half a million oysters on an acre of, wa of, of water. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, we have, we only grow about 250, 300,000 on a big year mm. of growing oysters. Um, and we're a small to medium farm. Right. So, you know, with five and a quarter acre, you can fill that thing up. Um, that's us personally. Other places, you know, if you have a lot more food, you can put more oysters. If you have less food, less oysters. Um, but yeah, so, so personally for us, yeah, we've got a lot of room. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Sarah uh, asks about your favorite way to eat or cook oysters. It's got to be raw, right? No. Uh, I, <laughs> I, so, what's up, Sarah? Nice, nice, uh, great question. Sarah's part of Coastal Federation, which is a oh, great, um, just a, just a great organization. They've done a lot to help the oyster industry. So, um, shout out to Coastal Fed. Uh, my favorite way to eat or cook oysters. So, two. One is raw, mm -hmm. on a cracker, like we said lemon hot sauce uh, and horseradish, or lemon hot sauce and cocktail. Mm -hmm. Okay, really, really good, chew that thing up. And then also, uh, spent some time in New Orleans and they have char-grilled oysters over there. So a char-grilled oyster is an oyster that you shuck, you put it on the grill, you make up like a butter. So mm -hmm. we do it with a lot of garlic, butter, and then a lot of Italian seasoning, more Italian seasoning than what you think. Okay, you want the butter to, to be greenish right right so a lot of italian seasoning shuck the oyster put it on the charcoal grill add the butter to it right and then uh in new orleans at a place called drago's they use a 33 33 33 percent blend of cheese okay they use romano uh parmesan and pecorino right we just like to use 50 50 parmesan and romano cheese gotcha so put that on the oyster grill it Oh, it's going to be great. You're going to love it. Even if you don't like oysters. That sounds decadent. <laughs> oh, it's great, dude. It's great. It's great. Um, we have a question here about asking about poaching or boat disturbance. Huh. Well, you know, I've said a lot of nice things about North Carolina. Um, and so I hope this doesn't get redundant. But, you know, we don't, we just haven't had to deal with that. People. Right. We, I'll have people kayak through the oyster farm, right? Mm -hmm. I'll be sitting there listening to music, counting oysters. All of a sudden, I'll look up, you know, kayakers are going by. Right. We'll have boats go there and fish. Um, people, you know, we're, we're normally good folks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so we haven't had to deal with any kind of stealing. Um, we've had a, a boat, or we assume it's a boat. It ran over one of our cages and uh, ripped the top off, which... I don't know how you would do that, but it happened. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I felt myself just feeling bad for the boater. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's some that's somebody's lower unit and their skeg that got uh, that probably got pretty tore up. So yeah. we we just you know I think there's been some reports of that, but um, we you know we haven't had to deal with it. The folks at Har you know Harker's Island people are great. Yeah. Um, and we've been very welcomed, and uh, we're happy to be there. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think you talked a little bit about how long it takes to grow an oyster and some of the limiting factors. Do you want to talk yeah. a little bit of science yeah. for Grace? Yeah, Grace. Okay. Um, so what we have to remember here is that these are animals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though they don't have brains and central nervous systems, they still grow at different rates. Right. So I tell folks it's, it's, really, it's really similar to like a bell curve, right? like this. So you're going to have fast growers over here. A fast growing oyster is going to be at our farm uh, 10 to 12 months, so yeah. one year. So 20%, right, really fast growers. Most of them, the 60%, are going to be in this middle part of the bell curve. Yeah. And that takes about a year and a half. Yeah. So from that year to year and a half mark, 12 to 18 months. And then there's slow growers, because again, they're just animals, right? And then it also depend, might depend on where they are in an oyster bag, all these different things. But primarily the last 20% might take two years. Right. Now, Carl, we have oysters that have been on our farm for three years that are probably just two inches, you know, long. Right. That's it. They're still alive. They're still filtering water. Yeah. You can still shuck them and eat them, but they will not get bigger than two inches. I see. Yeah. So. Huh. Um, How long it, can an oyster live? I guess. Oh, that dude. <laughs> well, it depends on the species, right? Yeah. But um, with. If you gave them the right conditions, I don't know. We found oysters that are eight, nine years old. Wow. And then, um, you know, if you look back in, in prehistoric times and pre-colonial times, there's some species that really get up there. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, it is. 
Are you going to write an oyster cookbook anytime in your future? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Three right? ingredients, cheese, oysters, <laughs> cheese and butter, cheese right? and butter. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's all you need. There it is. Cookbook's written. Wonderful. <laughs> well, any other questions, folks? Oh, that, that was a real question about the oyster cookbook. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out for Kelly. Right, yeah. yeah. Why don't you write it, Kelly? <laughs> that sounds great. I'd love to read it. Well, you, you've made me feel really proud about um, the North Carolina coast, our ecosystems, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the industry, and the community that you've built around it. So thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, thanks for having me, yeah. and thanks, everybody, for, for joining in. Absolutely. This is a great time. Um, and, uh, yeah, th thanks a lot, bro. Yeah. Happy Oyster Week, everybody.